Welcome to the Prospect League podcast, the podcast for the past, present, and future of the Prospect League, the home of elite college baseball players from across the country. Our first show in 2023 will be joined by Prospect League Commissioner David Brower. But just before we get to that interview, I want to take a moment to introduce myself and this brand new Prospect League podcast. Hello. I'm Lucas Burris, the host of this new Prospect League podcast, and for me, the 2023 season will be my third season in the Prospect League for the past two. I've been a part of the Illinois Valley Pistol Shrimp in Peru, Illinois, and now I'll take on this role as well as continuing my role with the Pistol Shrimp as hosting of their podcast as well, the Shrimp League Good podcast, along with being the voice of Pistol Shrimp Baseball on Prospect League TV and the Pistol Shrimp radio network. I couldn't be more excited to bring you this new Prospect League podcast. We've spent a lot of time and energy crafting exactly what we want this podcast to be for you, either potential Prospect League fan, or if you're a diehard, go bees faithful out there tuning in just like you did in the previous iterations of this podcast. Thanks for joining me so far. We've got so much exciting things coming your way, and I couldn't be more excited to bring you all the stuff we have in store for you on all of the Prospect League channels, but especially here on the brand new video version of the Prospect League podcast. This podcast is going to be interview centered. We're going to bring you past present names in Prospect League baseball, whether we start with our commissioner, whether we bring you current players and coaches, or whether we dive into our long history of alumni, whether it's an MLB Hall of Famer like Mike Schmidt, whether it's a MLB All-Star like Ben Zobris, we're going to try to get those interviews. We're going to try to bring you that content to show you what the Prospect League has been, what it will be, and why College Summer League Baseball is so important and why you should be a fan and enjoy the Prospect League, why I'm assuming if you're here right now, you probably already are, but if you haven't taken in a Prospect League game, hopefully this podcast gives you that itch to take it in and understand this, the illustrious history that is the Prospect League. But it's all going to get started here with episode number one of the brand new Prospect League podcast, and it's all going to start with Commissioner David Brower. We're going to interview our brand new Prospect League commissioner who just got hired in January to be the brand new commissioner of the Prospect League. He's got a long background in sports, including some time as a media relations director at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois, and as an assistant commissioner at the Summit League, which is a Division I athletic conference that you might know. It's got teams like Oral Roberts and South Dakota State. David has so much background in sports, so much to talk about, and it's such an exciting conversation. So I do not want to take any more of your time. I want to head straight to our interview with Prospect League Commissioner David Brower. Prospect League Commissioner David Brower, welcome to the Prospect League podcast. Excited to have you here. Well, thanks for having me, Lucas. It's good to kick this off and be part of the first one. So, uh, you know, when you're part of the first one, that's a, a special moment, right? You could say you had an inside scoop somewhere to get on the first one. I'm not sure, but you might have might have had an inside track. But, you know, you're a busy man these days, jumping right in. You're now three months into your new role. Uh, how are you settling in in the Prospect League front office? Yeah, it seems, you know, in some ways, it seems like yesterday was the beginning. And it seems like in some ways, it's uh, almost been a year or something like that. But uh, yeah, there's a lot to learn, a certain a lot of learning curve involved, um, trying to really understand each team, each market, uh, what's been done before, what's the purpose behind it. Uh, you know, there's just, and even down to the intricate details of uh, just some of the, the little things that occur as you lead into a season, whether it's on the business side or whether it's something that, uh, you know, is set up for, for games and, and those types of things as we get toward uh, opening day. So, uh, definitely a lot to learn, um, you know, starting to get a, a feel for it. But ultimately, I think the learning curve, uh, I wouldn't I would wouldn't say it ever ends, but it definitely will be more comfortable as we get through an entire year and the cycle of a, a full season and uh, and a full off season. Yeah, absolutely. And you have somewhat of a, a nice background in terms of, you know, athletics and sports, but, you know, you're coming in kind of, I would say not so much blind, but your background, it wasn't, you were a commissioner at a summer college league baseball league before, you know, we know that you have time at NIU as an SID or as a, uh, a media relations, you know, where you're at the summit league as an assistant commissioner, but what is your background in sports outside of that? Did you play? Did you participate? Did you coach high school, college, anything? What is your, you know, drawing to sports outside of now you're a sports commissioner? 
Sure. I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different paths to these jobs, um, whether it's a, a college environment, a professional environment, uh, you know, something like this college summer league, uh, and they're all very different. And whether it's the path or whether it's the job itself, they all have their nuances. They all have their similarities. Uh, in my case, as, as you mentioned, my background is, is working in uh, mainly college athletics, uh, you know, started out when I was in college, uh, working in the sports information office at the University of Illinois, uh, knew that that was kind of my calling, the publicity side, the writing side, the statistics side, uh, you know, grew that uh, into a couple internships in the NFL when I was in college uh, and then post-college and then working on campus for a couple different schools, um, Purdue, Northern Illinois, you mentioned South Carolina, um, baseball in particular, Purdue and Northern Illinois and a couple of great coaches there that were phenomenal to work with, Doug Schreiber and Ed Matthey, uh, and then ultimately to the uh, Summit League and uh, as, as assistant commissioner there where oversaw all the external communications, a lot of the marketing side as well, just to really gain our visibility, whether it was through uh, national broadcasts, whether it was through national media outlets, um, but really raise that profile. And that league had tremendous growth in the 10 years that I was there. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a little credit for it, but it wasn't all me by any stretch. That's for sure. Uh, I had an outstanding staff uh, that helped me and then also administrators uh, in our office as well and a, just a great group around the league uh, to get there. So, um, you know, really proud of what we did there. A lot, a lot of that centered around our, our basketball championships that uh, gained notoriety as one of the best in the country, both on the men's and women's side, uh, with just outstanding support and attendance and sponsorships and television coverage uh, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So um, in terms of my athletic background, it was uh, pretty nondescript. Um, you know, I, uh, as far as... Uh, you know, playing, it wasn't too much, uh, there wasn't too much limelight after, say, Little League, but, uh, you know, coaching-wise, it's limited to, uh, you know, one year coaching my my son when he was nine, so, um, you know, that was, uh, you know, the extent of that. It's really been focused on the the business side of things and those positions in college athletics and, and uh, gaining that knowledge and, uh, you know, moving it forward through taking a little bit from each place you've been. I'm sure you had a good run as a one year assistant little leaguer had a little league coach. I'm sure you, I'm sure you put some work in for that. So. Well, and there, there was one season I was head coach um, and uh, you know, we had a team that, uh, you know, we finished seventh out of eight in the regular season, but uh, we went down with a fight in our tournament game against the number two seed. And, and actually it's funny. It was probably the, the greatest moment of that season. Something I always remember, to be honest with you is, uh, you know, I think each kid had their best game of the year, that game. And we ended up, instead of playing six innings, we went like a full 10 innings and it was, it felt like a major league game. It was, it was fun. We didn't uh, win, but it was yeah. fun. In the end, you didn't have the outcome you <laughs> wanted, but, but, you know, you put all your eggs in the basket for that last one though, but you continue to talk about, you know, what drew you to sports and what drives you to sports, but you're now in baseball, you're, you know, your focus is baseball. So what is continually bringing you back to, you know, the game that we all love that the listeners are here because they enjoy, because anyone in the prospect league does what initially drew you to baseball and, you know, what keeps drawing you back to the game of baseball? Sure. I think there's so many things that the sport offers that are unique. And, you know, we all trace baseball roots in some way back to, you know, our childhood, whether it's uh, playing or, or watching games, going to games, uh, being part of, uh, you know, those activities and, and uh, you know, collecting baseball cards or whatever it might be. And that's kind of what draws you in initially. And then as, as you learn more about it and, and get more involved in it, uh, you know, I think it just grows and it's something that just doesn't go away. Um, it's, it's one of those sports that I think uh, once you're hooked, you're hooked for life. And I, in particular for me with, uh, with this position, um, I've always had a great uh, interest in, in the college game as well, not just the major leagues uh, growing up near a major university, um, you know, being able to go to some of those games and uh, really see the excitement there, but also, um, you know, seeing it on a national stage and, and being part of it uh, through some of the experiences I've had at universities where we either hosted some really exciting games and or played in some outstanding venues at some big time programs. So I think that's all kind of come together in, in this role with, uh, you know, college baseball and, uh, you know, being part of the business side of it as well. Yeah. And, you know, diving into 
you know, what's going to happen on this side of things. You know, your love for the game of baseball has drawn you to this position, but now you're in the opportunity where even you have large or small chances to make an impact on the game of baseball, whether you view it like that or not, you have the opportunity to allow that one player, even if it's just one to develop more and, you know, get drafted or get scouted or whatever it is. You're now in this role where you have an opportunity, you know, to make a difference in the game of baseball. So in this role, you know, what are your goals for the prospect league from the number of teams you plan on moving from 16 to 17 to 18 or, you know, down or up, whatever your thoughts are radio and TV. What are, what are your goals on that side or just how you want to see the league go under your leadership? Yeah, and the, all those are very important areas for this league. I think there's so many touch points that this league has, um, whether it's through, uh, you know, with player development, um, you're taking college players and helping them become better players. Maybe they're a junior college player and, and they want to get better to, uh, you know, join a four year program and, and be an impactful player in, in those locations. Or uh, even if it's just a player that maybe didn't get the playing time this season, maybe they were a freshman at a, a larger school or a higher profile program, and they just want to, you know, get that playing time and get this experience, get those reps in the summer. Uh, so, I, you know, whether it's a first round pick, whether it's a player that's just going to start somewhere next year at any whether it's division one, division two, II, division three, any of those levels, you know, I think those are really what we should stand for in terms of our mission. And, you know, that's something that shouldn't be lost in what we do. And what I'd like to see is take that development, not only on the field, but do some things off the field um, that we can help these players. Uh, you know, they have a little more time in the summer. It's they're not worried about going to class, not worried about, uh, you know, a lot of the, um, things that they have to do on campus during a season or, or during an academic year. So um, whether that's maybe entering into some of the NIL areas, giving it an opportunity there, um, whether it's through some opportunities to develop in other areas, um, you know, with the sport, whether it's kind of the mental side of the game or, uh, you know, some different things that may be helpful to supplement what they're gaining on the field. I think that's really important. Um, you talk about the number of teams, uh, you know, I think first and foremost, the, the, the first step will be to getting back to an even number just for the logistical aspect, uh, make things a little more um, simplified when it comes to scheduling and, and those areas. Um, I don't want to set a number of teams. I mean, that could be variable. Uh, you know, it just depends on where we are as the health of our league and where we are with our individual franchises. And when you look into you know, the media side of things, I think uh, there's a lot of opportunities there. Certainly we have a, a great start with PLTV and the opportunity to have every game streamed and and people to uh, see our product, even if they're not there in person at the ballpark. Uh, but, uh, you know, expanding those opportunities, just really gaining the visibility side. And I know we've, we've put together some initiatives here in the spring to um, really showcase our players that are currently in college that came through the league, some of the players that'll be coming into the league this summer. Uh, you know, when you have a matchup of LSU and Arkansas, that's gaining all the attention in the top five uh, this past weekend, um, you know, we have starting player on each team came from prospect league. So those things shouldn't be lost on what we do and, and uh, how we focus our, our efforts with name recognition. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the big thing that we look at, you know, in terms of just the team level is, is how we can, you know, develop those players, but everyone has that idea, either from the fan perspective or from, you know, the team perspective or from even the front office perspective is how far can we go or what is that big, you know, goal we want to think, want to achieve. So in just in general, just in a, a few sentences or one thought, what do you envision is the peak of the prospect league? You know, what is the prospect league moving into new heights look like? Yeah, I think really establishing itself with a strong reputation amongst the college ranks as being a place where you can send your players to get that uh, extra boost in terms of what you need for their development. And then also from the scouting side to you know, have these players develop, give an opportunity for uh, major league clubs to look at potential draft picks down the road, whether it's the draft coming up or subsequent ones in, in the near future. Uh, you know, I think those areas are 
probably the target uh, or should be the target. And then ultimately your reputation will grow from there. And to gain that visibility, that notoriety, to attach yourself with some of these names and accomplishments that uh, occur on the field, whether it's in college or in professional baseball, um, you know, I think that really brings it all full circle. And uh, and then also the, the side of just being somewhat a league that's very fan friendly, um, one that, uh, you know, is, it's the outing, the affordable outing, I guess, for families that uh, want to come out to the ballpark and enjoy uh, some time together and, and watch a good product on the field and, uh, you know, really gain those that traction as well and have a strong community bond between our teams and, and uh, their locations and the fans. Yeah, I mean, just diving into more from that fan perspective, you know, that's a big question that a lot of people want to know in, in general. You know, we kind of leave it up to the teams a little bit, but from, you know, your your perspective, what do you want that general fan to experience when they take in a prospect league game? Like, what do you envision all 17 teams allowing each fan to experience no matter what? Yeah, I think that anyone that comes to one of our ballparks and attends one of our games, I think they should, uh, you know, the hope is to, have them come away saying, well, that was entertaining and I want to go back. That's the end goal. Uh, whether that comes through some promotions that uh, uh, they really enjoyed or uh, some sort of uh, act that came in and, and was uh, part of the event that night, um, having a good product on the field and something that provides entertaining baseball, quality baseball. And I think really important is getting that fan interaction and the player accessibility uh, you know i mean you see it at, at the highest levels at major league baseball you don't see too many kids out there getting autographs anymore but at this level um you know i think that should be something that's really imperative is to have uh, opportunities for the players to engage with the fans especially the young fans because you never know um you know what what kid at the ballpark that night might be inspired by a player um, maybe a bond that they form and uh, may inspire them to be the next player in the prospect league down the road all right that's as far as i'll dive into until maybe the very end in terms of you know how you're feeling about the prospect league let's mix it up let's go long a little bit let's talk about you know you and and your opinions of baseball and how you're feeling about stuff so i'm going to dive right into my favorite question i like asking people right now what are your views on these new rules in Major League Baseball? Do you like the idea of banning the shift? How are you feeling about the pitch clock? Do you want an automated strike zone? You know, let us know how you feel about all the stuff that's going on in Major League Baseball. Sure, and there's there's a lot. Um, it's you know, I think when you first read and hear about these things. I, the majority of us, especially that follow the game and maybe have a little bit of a purist side look at it with some hesitancy. And I think as you see them put into place, uh, you know, it, it makes more sense and you see the results. Um, you know, in my opinion, say the pitch clock right now, um, I always tend to view things from a, a pitcher side. So uh, I can see how they're taking advantage of it, which, um, you know, kind of uh, if you're, you know, you see what Max Scherzer does or someone like that. Um, but it's definitely sped up the game. And I, I don't see any harm in that. You know, does a pitcher need to be 45 seconds between pitches? No. Um, you know, in a, in a high leverage situation, you know, you could be a little more deliberate, but, you know, 20 seconds may be a good number. There's a couple of nuances that personally I'm maybe not so fan, fond of, like, uh, say, throwing over to first how many times, because if you reach that mark, then it's pretty much an automatic. As a runner, it's automatic. I'm not uh, worried about a throw over here. I can take off. Uh, you know, the shift ban, I think, um, I think that's something that's good for the game because it allows for more players to contribute in more ways. Uh, you know, growing up, I can remember some of the guys that were just, you know, 275 hitters that had five home runs, but they were a critical part of a lineup. So, uh, you know, those, those types of players, I think, uh, benefit from it. Um, personally, I always enjoyed the, uh, the exciting uh, hit and run, stolen bases, not wait around for the three run homer all the time. Uh, I think we need to get back to more of that in the game. Um, you know, so I think those those areas are good. Uh, but yeah, it's it's interesting to see it all develop as opposed to just talking about it and uh, you know seeing it on paper when it's first announced. 
Yeah. Small ball type. That's what we're taking away. That that the commission is a small ball type. He likes <laughs> he likes his blunts. He likes his steals. You know, if we're throwing you in the dugout for a guest appearance, the prospect league players get to know that we're playing small ball today. So <laughs> that's exciting. Um, you know, I'm diving into some more baseball stuff, you know, I see all the memorabilia behind you as well. You know, what's, what's in that, what's in that case behind you? Any, you know, big thing. Do you like to collect cards, baseballs, any big memorabilia that, you know, is your favorite in the game of baseball? Yeah. So, uh, to be, uh, open there and candid, the, the area behind me there is dedicated to the college world series. Um, that's something I've attended 20 times so far. And, uh, you know, try to make it an annual trip. Um, but uh, to me, it's it's probably the the most probably the most overlooked jewel in the sport of baseball. And people don't uh, maybe recognize that, especially in the Midwest, just because college baseball isn't as big as it is down in the South or other places in the country. But uh, you know, Omaha, Nebraska in June is is phenomenal. Um, really, uh, really a fun place to be. And, uh, you know, in terms of collecting, I, you know, as a kid, it was baseball cards. It was, you know, different memorabilia uh, items that came about, a lot of signed baseballs. That was back when baseball card shows were big and, and uh, you know, you'd get the celebrity autograph appearances from the, the kings of the game. And by that, I mean, you know, like the Joe DiMaggio's and the Hank Aaron's and the Willie Mays and Ted Williams. And, and so, you know, those are probably my, my favorite uh, baseball collect collections that i have uh are those baseballs but um you know it to me it's it's more uh you know based on the the personal side of it than maybe the value side of it yeah absolutely i gotta dive into those those 20 college baseball world series what is your favorite what is your you know moment in that what's your favorite game you've ever seen uh, at the college world series what sticks out Wow. There's uh there's a lot to pick from there. Um, you know, typically go for a few games a year, certainly not for the whole thing, but uh, you know, some of the championships um, have been really exciting. A lot of fun to be a part of that atmosphere. Uh, it was really neat to see a couple years ago, like when Mississippi state won their first championship that uh, you know, their fan base overtook Omaha, like uh, no other team I'd ever seen do that. And uh, you know, it was really like a home game and just the, the emotion and excitement that everyone had from, from that fan base. It was, it was cool to see a program that was so good for so long, finally get over the hump and, and get that national championship. Um, you know, I go back to probably some of the ones I went to uh, in my younger days as, you know, as a kid, as a teenager and, and some of the guys that you'd see play and see them in the majors later, uh, you know, that that was kind of neat to see them uh, at, at that level and excel and, and be stars and uh, you know, my first uh, College World Series I went to was in 1992 and that was the last one for uh, Ron Frazier, the uh, coach at Miami who's someone that I uh, really put up as as one of my baseball heroes just for what he did for college baseball and and the game itself and uh, I was actually able to uh, meet him before a game on his way in you know and uh, got that handshake and and uh, so that was kind of a cool interaction yeah and then you never washed your hand for a week you that, that kind of kid <laughs> that was like oh I got I got the handshake oh my god uh, but, uh, you know, when you go there as well, I won't, I, there's a few things that I can pick and pull from of what you just said, but I, I got to get into, you know, you've been to all these games. What is your spot at the ballpark? Take us through what you do when you head to a game, whether it's a prospect league game, a little league game or a college world series or major league, where are you sitting? Where's your preference? Is it hot dog? Is it beer? What are you doing uh, when you head to a game? Well, I'm going to make it sound like I'm it's going to sound like I'm maybe not that fun to go to a game with because I actually like to watch the game, yeah. but uh, no, I really like to enjoy the, um, the competitive side of it to see the, uh, you know, the strategy play out the um, nuances that uh, occur during the, the course of a game. So I'm going behind the plate. I want to watch the pitcher. I want to see, you know, what he throws um, at a major league game. I'm probably calling up a uh, pitcher's list website to get kind of a breakdown of what it is. Um, when I'm with my son, we like to study that a little bit because he's a, a pitcher as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's fun to kind of see what the best in the world do with those uh, in those games and what makes them uh, makes it work for them. Um, but yeah, that's typically my spot. I love to be behind the plate. So kind of get a best view of the action uh, that way. Um, you know, food wise, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a big ballpark food connoisseur just because I, I don't want to waste the time in the concession stand, to be honest with you. Um, 
So now, wait, wait, hold I, what time do you arrive? That's the question. So we'll we'll, we'll dig into this. What, when are you at a game? That depends. Um, you know, if it's a major league game, especially if it's a ballpark I haven't been to, I definitely want to get there, you know, pretty early. Uh, maybe not necessarily when the gates open, but allow enough time to uh, kind of meander through the park, take it all in. Um, you know, if it, anywhere really that it's a new park, you, you want to kind of see what it's all about and what some of the special features are. I think that's always fun. That's uh, part of the adventure, I guess. Um, you know, if it's a, you know, smaller scope game or someplace I've been a lot, you know, maybe it's closer to game time or, you know, enough to get settled in and, and be ready to go. Yeah. No matter for me, no matter what game it is, I'm getting there early. Cause I, it's the system of getting there early. You're walking around. So like my parks regularly, I'm a Cubs fan and we're not going to hide it. I'm an Illinois kid. So when I go to Wrigley, I'm their gates open. That's the idea. Their gates open head to the seat, make sure the seat's there. I don't know why I always do that, but that's how I've always done it. Make sure the seat exists. Then we're going to the concession stand there, and then we're sitting, we're done. That is that is the line. We'll, we'll see the hot dog vendor or the beer or soda vendor as it comes by, but like that is the, that's the goal is to drink hot dog or whatever food I'm having, sit, and we're done, and I will sit in that seat from the hour before the game until the end of it because that's, you know, I agree with you there. But I, I can just, I have to ask, you got that scorecard out. Are you the you going to the game and are you filling out that scorecard or no? I am not. That's too much to keep track of. I feel I, I was getting the vibe that you were you were filling out a scorecard. I don't know what it was. But uh, we, we we cut that. We we gotta get rid of it then. Yeah, I've done it enough uh in my days as an SID that uh you know I don't want to be it's, obligated it's, to it. It's when work. I'm... Yeah, there's a work it mindset is, it there. Is. All right, let's let's reel it in a little bit. Let's let's get to our last round of questions. You know, you touched on it a little bit, but I want to dig straight into uh, and let you talk about, you know, your baseball hero. What is that person who you look up to uh, in the baseball world? Who do you model your work after or just model your love of the game after? Who is that person uh, who you look up to? Yeah, I think strictly from the baseball sense, um, you know, I, again, kind of gravitating toward the college game, uh, Ron Frazier that I mentioned is someone that uh, was so instrumental in the growth of the game and did it well beyond, uh, well ahead of his time. I mean, he was really putting the college baseball on the map in the 1980s. And a lot of what you see today with the growth of the game, whether it's uh, the television side of it, whether it's the attendance, some of the ballparks that exist, especially down south, uh, he was the one that instigated all that. And he's the one that's responsible and helped grow a lot of programs just by uh, being a soundboard and, and really laying out the blueprint for a lot of coaches and sharing that with them. Um, you know, another one from the college side is Augie Garrido. Um, you know, he, what he did uh, as a coach at Fullerton, um, someone else who built a program from scratch, uh, didn't have a ton of resources there, um, actually coached at Illinois for three years. Uh, and, I, you know, that's probably how I kind of got into college baseball because he had some pretty good teams uh, before he went back to Fullerton in the sunshine and the warm uh, weather to recruit players better. But, uh, uh, you know, he's another one that I think has uh, really had a great effect on the game. Skip Bertman that came from the Ron Frazier tree as well. I mean, that's that's another one that uh, has been such a giant of college baseball. Um, you know, I think on the on the major league side, I think, um, you know, as far as like favorite players, I mean, historically, and I'm a big history buff, uh, you know, I've always been drawn to Hank Aaron and his story, um, you know, kind of uh, the accomplishments, obviously, that he had and what he went through uh, to get there. Um, you know, some favorite players as a kid, you know, just for whatever reason, probably because I played the position in Little League or something like that. But uh, believe it or not, they're kind of off the radar, like Jack Clark or, uh, you know, Dwight Gooden or someone like that. But, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the business side of things, I think uh, some mentors that I've had um, that have really helped, uh, you know, not only me personally, but just to kind of have that uh, visual and take notes from, I think, uh, one of them would really be Jim Phillips, uh, who's commissioner at the ACC now, but he was the athletic director at Northern Illinois when I was there. Um, just the way he operated was tremendous, just a, a really a sharp guy and, and uh, very successful, obviously, in what he's done. And, and you know, I've had some immediate bosses on the, you know, in the SID office and uh, some assistant ADs, and I could get into a long list of names and I'd probably forget someone. So I hate to do that. But, uh, you know, those those are the types of people that, you know, you take a little bit from each one and those experiences and, and you try to mold that into your own. 
you get into kind of that awards speech kind of thing as a as you as to your hero as you go well i i better i better list every every executive producer in my life who's who's ever helped me there so yeah um i got i just one more or at least one or two we'll see how you frame this this question for you but you know in terms of the prospect league i know you love everything that you have dove into in terms of your short time as commissioner so far you know what is something you know that people should know about the prospect league that you now know that you wish was out there in the world more you know someone who's taking in this podcast what's one thing you want them to take away on you know what is so important about the prospect league yeah i think um probably the most easily identifiable piece is the history here. And while it goes back to the league officially being known as the prospect league since 2009, its origins and its roots go back to the central Illinois collegiate league. And that goes all the way back to 1963. And you'll see some uh, pieces that were, you know, celebrating 60 years of baseball because really that became the prospect league eventually. And when that started in 1963, I actually didn't know this, but uh, it was one of the original uh, summer leagues and actually overseen by the NCAA. So they had some governance uh, uh, in terms of uh, the summer leagues that existed back then. And uh, that's how that grew. But uh, when you look through the names of uh, the players that have played in this league, there's a lot of notable major leaguers, whether recent, uh, you know, like a Ben Zobrist, a Sean Manaya. Um, but you go back in history and, and Mike Schmidt and Kirby Puckett played in this league. And that, you know, I think that's a, a really great, uh, you know, those are great names to be associated with and, and to have that in our history. Um, and then certainly a lot of college uh, players that were successful there that either uh, maybe didn't make the major leagues or maybe didn't have a stellar major league career or, or overly notable. Um, you know, you look at Warren Morris, who played in the majors for a couple of years, but he's most remembered for the probably the most famous home run in the College World Series history in 1996. And he played in this league. Um, we've had Olympians play in this league. Uh, you know, so there's, there's, there's managers that have gone on to be managers that maybe weren't notable players. So there's just a lot of history that's interesting uh, that we can tie back into and, and I think celebrate. But, uh, you know, it also gives something to build upon for the future and uh, gives gives the incentive of who's who's going to be the next insert your name here. You know, uh, so, uh, you know, that, that's one unique aspect of this league that there's a lot of lineage that traces back to really the origins of, of college summer leagues. For uh, the listeners there as well, those are going on right now on our social media as well. So if you are, you know, checking out this podcast, make sure you check out that social media, what David's talking about there. We're going to count down 60 days with 60 names that are notable in Prospect League. They're already out right now uh, as you're listening to this podcast. So make sure you check that out on our social media. I got one more final question for the commish and it's what are you doing to get excited for May 31st? That is the opening day of Prospect League Baseball. What are you doing to get excited? What should the fans do to get excited? And just in general, how excited are you for your first opening day uh, of the Prospect League? Yeah, definitely looking forward to it. Uh, really want to see how uh, the league plays out, you know, have some familiarity with it, um, you know, from before and summer leagues from before, but uh, to really be a part of it and be part of the the prospect league culture and, and uh, you know, see these markets in person and, and how the fan bases are. Uh, I made a couple stops here um, during the off season, kind of the hot stove circuit, if you will. Uh, and, you know, there's excitement in these locations and, and these these cities should be proud of these teams. This is your town team. This is your uh, in, in some ways, it's kind of like the old school town team, minor league. You know, let's take pride in, in what we have because, you know, the major leagues are a couple hour drive away. Um, so, you know, I think that's going to be really interesting to see. And I think that's what everyone should be excited about is just getting back on the field, um, seeing these players that are they're going to develop into future stars somewhere. Uh, pretty good chance you're going to see somebody come through your ballpark, whether it's on your team or one of the visiting teams that's going to be playing in the majors within a couple of years. So uh, and if not, you're going to see several more that are, you know, on television playing college ball um so uh you know i think that's the thing if we count it down and then obviously i think the the thing that we're all looking forward to is some summertime weather you know especially up here in the midwest where we're uh you know just trying to get through a spring and and get something to uh, get outside and enjoy so i think all those elements come together in the prospect league and it's it really is summertime fun and and uh baseball in in your town 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm itching to get back in that booth as the weather changes. I mean, this is scratching a little bit of that itch, but I'm excited for that, you know, to be cheering on those prospect league teams. All right. I want to thank the commission for joining me. Do you have any final thoughts before I let you go? Lucas, I think this is great. I think this uh, podcast, I really want to make sure that everyone uh, remembers to tune into this, to check this out, because we there's a lot of, uh, as we talked about the history and the different areas of the league, um, I think you're going to learn a lot more about the personalities that have either come through this league or and have been part of this league and gone on to really successful opportunities elsewhere to uh, those players that are looking to carve out their names and to find uh, their roles and their futures, uh, whether it's on the field, whether it's in the front office, whether it's, uh, you know, in another business altogether. So, um, you know, that that's something I think everyone should look forward to and, and getting to know these players through uh, this forum. Yeah, absolutely. I want to thank you uh, for joining me here on the Prospect League podcast and make sure you check out all that Commissioner David Brower is doing because every time you see anything going on in the Prospect League, he's making his impact. He's already making an impact. So thank you for joining me uh, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks again to Prospect League Commissioner David Brower for taking the time to join me on the Prospect League podcast today. Before we wrap up this inaugural episode of the Prospect League podcast, I want to take you through three things you need to know about the Prospect League right now. The Prospect League is celebrating 60 years of baseball here in 2023. That's from 1963 to 2023 from the Central Illinois Collegiate League, which was the predecessor to the Prospect League. To the Prospect League today, it's been 60 years of baseball and we're celebrating those 60 years by counting down 60 notable alumni, 60 days until opening day. So that started on April 1st, which would have been last Saturday, or if you're watching or listening to this podcast a few weeks later, it was just April 1st for you. But that countdown's going on on our social media right now. That's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Prospect League. So go give us a follow. Check that out. All the notable alumni. It's very exciting 60-day countdown to highlight some of our illustrious history in the Prospect League. You'll see the names of Mike Schmidt to Art Howe to Ben Zobris to Chris Coglin. So many names that you might not have realized played in the Prospect League. You can check out their career history and all that on our social media going on right now. As well in the Prospect League, number two thing you need to know, the Thrillville Thrillbillies have a new name for their home. It is now Mountain Dew Park down there in Marion, Illinois, as the home of the Thrillbillies. You can check out all the Thrillbilly news at Go Thrillbillies on social media and at GoThrillbillies.com. And lastly, lots of exciting past and present Prospect League players are competing right now, including the likes of Prospect League alumni in Major League Baseball. J.D. Brubaker and Sean Manaya should be pitching very very soon for their respected clubs and the pirates and the giants. So be on a lookout for their starts more than likely coming up this week. If you're watching this on Monday, they might've already pitched if you're watching it later, but check out everyone that's going on in the prospect league alumni and major league baseball. There's a graphic currently on our social media as well, highlighting current alumni who are on opening day rosters. And there's some alumni who just played for us competing this week as well. Prospect league all-star in 2022 and 2022 Alton river dragon, Blake Burris and Arkansas state are taking on 2022 Cape catfish. John Bolton and Arkansas Tuesday night. That's 6 p.m. Tuesday night on the SEC Network Plus. So check that out for some current college players who just played in the Prospect League, playing in some SEC baseball, uh, some some good baseball in terms of the SEC Network Plus. So check that out. That's what's going on right now. Three things that you need to know for Prospect League. But that about wraps up our show. So I finally, I want to thank you for joining me on this inaugural episode of the Prospect League podcast. Please like, comment, and subscribe to let me know if you enjoyed today's episode. And use those comments below on YouTube to let me know what topics you want me to cover and who you want to interview next. We're lining up interviews right now about the history of the Prospect League. So if you have a name on our website that you see that you want me to interview, let me know. And maybe, just maybe, we'll get to your topic or cover who you want to be interviewed. But until next time, I'm Lucas Burris signing off and thanking you for joining me on the Prospect League podcast.